Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to the Arts Catalyst space. And yeah, well, uh, I'm personally very excited about this program. It's, uh, as you may know, it's about astrobiology, which is an amazing new field of research within uh, this different space uh, disciplines. And it's about actually life, its origins, its limits, and um, Cosmica, this, this series of events, is part of, the, um, in, of ITACUS, which is a technical committee for the cultural utilizations of space of the International Astronautical Federation, long names. And, bravo. <laughs> and um, and, and every, every, every year we meet in, in, in a different seat in the world, it's this massive uh, International Astronautical Congress and there's like around a thousand people that come here all the, everyone like space professionals from space agencies um, private sector uh, Boeing Virgin uh, rocket makers everything and and there's like endless number of, of, of conferences but last year I went to the conference of SETI have you heard of SETI yeah which is um, is the center for to, to search that well, that are searching extraterrestrial life, uh, intelligent life in other planets, and they're just getting signals and they study them. and And I, I was in that meeting, and it was like my first approach to to to, to seriously consider, like thinking about what's going on uh, with life in, in in other places. And and after doing a little bit of research, I uh, uh, found out that. Astrobiology is, a, is, a, is just a fascinating uh, field, and I really wanted to, to, to organize a cosmic around this theme, and we got amazing speakers to, uh, uh, today. And, well, we're going to start with Dr. Uh, Louis Darnell. Uh, Louis, he's a researcher based at University College London, and he studies how life and the signs of its existence might survive the intense uh, cosmic radiation on the surface of Mars. Um, Lewis has also published a, a very popular book, which is called um, Life in the Universe, A Beginner's Guide. So just to, 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 to start this evening, he's going to introduce, introduce us to this topic. I hope you will enjoy it. Evening. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, my name is Lewis. I'm a research scientist in the Centre for Planetary Sciences at University College London. And the science that I do there is in this new field called astrobiology. It's all about looking into the possibility of extraterrestrial life, of, of life beyond the Earth, um, or aliens, it's the science of aliens. Um, what my research is actually all about, what I do at University College London, just down the road, um, and what my PhD thesis was published on, this is the, the title running in gold lettering down this spine of the hardback book um, which you have to publish as a, as, a, as a thesis before you get awarded your doctorate. My research is into the subsurface cosmic ionising radiation environment of Mars, which is a very long, um, impressive, Latin-y sounding phrase. Um, but if I, if I tell someone at a party that I've just met that that's what my research is all about, um, when they ask me what my science um, is, is looking into then, I get left by myself um, in the kitchen of that party the rest of the night, as I'm sure you can appreciate and understand, and I would deserve it. So I've learned the hard way to explain the science I do, the research I'm looking into, as looking into the Martian death rays. Now, these Martian death rays aren't being wielded by the tripods if they came to invade the Earth. The Martian death rays are what are killing off any native Martian life, there's any primitive, hardy, microbial bacterial life that has got started on Mars, it's been constantly bombarded by radiation from outer space, the so-called cosmic rays, but because Mars has no thick atmosphere, like we're protected um, by here on Earth, or a global deflector shield, which our Earth's magnetic field protects us from a lot of this radiation. So one of the big questions about the possibility of life on the surface of Mars, where we could dig it up with one of our robots, is how long it could survive this radiation. So to look into this, I've been doing a combination of computer models, uh, simulations of what this radiation is like, 
um, like this kind of cartoon on the left. But I'm, I'm a biologist. I, I did a, uh, a first degree in biology. So I like to get my hands nice and wet and, and dirty in the lab doing real experiments with, with real life, with real cells. And I've been culturing some bacteria from this place here. This is one of the coldest, driest environments anywhere on the surface of the planet. This is called the Dry Valleys environment in Antarctica. It's far, far drier than the Sahara Desert. Uh, this is a cold desert. And about the only water that exists in this region is the snow caps, the mountains in the distance, and these frozen over lakes, which are frozen over all year round. Um, and these dry valleys were thought to be sterile, they were thought to be about the only place on the planet that has no life at all. There's no animal life, no plant life whatsoever. Um, but there's bacterial life, it's living underground or, or living inside the rocks themselves. You have to crack open rocks in this place in Antarctica to find thin bands of green, thin bands of life hiding inside the rocks to protect themselves. Um, and by growing up to these bacteria in the lab, getting them nice and healthy and happy, I then blast them with high doses of gamma rays to try to get them to die again. Because I know what their resistance to radiation is, I can compare this biological information with these computer simulations, what the radiation is like on Mars, and, and get some kind of idea about how deep underground something would have to be to have survived uh, the radiation on Mars. How deep we're going to have to dig with our probes or with our human astronauts to, to find life that may have survived until today. Um, but when, what I wanted to do tonight, that is the only slide on my actual research, the rest of it is a, is a very broad introduction to the science of astrobiology, which you can sum up um, in this very nice phrase that I've nicked straight off the NASA website. That astrobiology is the quest to understand our origins, where all of us came from, where, where all of the life on a planet um, originated from. What was that event or sequence of events that formed the genesis of life on planet Earth? And then how has that life evolved and changed and adapted and diversified over billions of years of our planet's history? And of most interest to me, how has that life distributed? Is Earth unique and special? Is it is the only planet in the entire galaxy to have biology, to have life on it? Or, or perhaps is life commonplace? Is it common as muck? And maybe there's plenty of, of wet rocks out there in the heavens teeming with life and just waiting for us to go out and find it. So you can sum up as astrobiology as the search for life beyond Earth. And life on Earth, as we know, it is very easy to spot. It's, it's big and obvious as ladybirds or toadstools or elephants and trees and weird squiggly green things and, and droplets of pond water when you zoom in with a microscope. But, but life is much more than this. Life is much more complex and sophisticated when you zoom down into the cells that make up all life on Earth. And I wanted to show you a, a, a brief video just to kick off to really try to hammer home what it is that life is and what life does and, and the kinds of things we're going to go looking for on other planets are signs of life, signs of biochemistry um, rather than the chemistry of rocks. So I've got a video for you here. It's called BioVisions. Um, it's put together by some biologists and computer animators at Harvard. I'm going to zoom in. This isn't entirely working. It's looking great on my laptop. Try this. Zinger. Um, so we zoomed into the surface of one of our cells and it's embedded um, with all these proteins and perform particular functions. And if we zoom inside our cell, inside this bag or sac that surrounds us, we see this ordered crisscrossed array of scaffolding proteins. This is just like the steel tubes or pipes you put up inside of a building to give them strength. We've got the same structure on a miniature scale inside each of our cells to give them strength. And these scaffolding proteins spontaneously form together out of their building blocks. And then when a pair of molecular scissors comes across and snips that chain, it falls apart again and returns its, its building blocks into the pool inside the cell. Um, it's another kind of scaffolding protein. Now my favourite protein of them all is this one. This is a molecular walking machine. It literally pods its way on cloud-like foot in front of the other, dragging stuff around inside the cell, taking things to where they need to be to do their job, to keep our cells alive. And we're going to zoom in to the very core of our kind of cell, the nucleus. 
place where we store and protect the information of life, the genetic code uh, stored on molecules of DNA. But what we're seeing here actually is a molecule of RNA. It's a simpler chemical in DNA. We think it came first in the origin of life. It's at some point, right at the dawn of life on Earth, we upgraded ourselves from being RNA-based life to being DNA-based. In the same way you'd upgrade your computer from Windows 95 to Windows XP. The very same process happened in our in our coding of life. It's our molecular walk machine again. It's phenomenal. And then once, once the cell has taken this information in its DNA and processed it and manufactured and synthesized different proteins, it transports them to the outside of the cell. We see them regurgitated onto the out outer membrane. And we see that these are the handshake proteins we saw right at the beginning. So we've kind of gone full circle in the day and life of one of our cells. And these handshake proteins reach up and hold hands with their counterparts outside the cell. So this white blood cell can stick inside of this capillary and then squeeze its way out and they go fight infection. This, this white blood cell is part of our immune system. It's off to go gobble some bacteria. But the point I want to get across with that video is that's what life is. This, this is what life does. And this is the, the astounding complexity of, of the molecular machinery. All of this was, was basically chemistry at the end of the day, but incredibly cunning chemistry that is running all the time inside all of our cells to keep us alive. And it's this kind of biochemistry that we have already started looking for on other planets, the signs of life rather than the chemistry of rocks. I want to talk very briefly about a, a whole category of organisms on Earth known as extremophiles, life that can survive in the most extreme, punishing, inhospitable places on, pla on the planet, uh, such as this place here. This is in Yellowstone Park in North America. It's a, a very volcanically active region. And you find these puddles of water, these geothermal lakes, that are heated from underneath by this geothermal activity, this volcanic activity. So they're very, very hot. They're, they're boiling hot water. And they're also very acidic, with all these volcanic gases bubbling up through them. And just for scale, there's a, a path running alongside here with some people walking along it. Now, if you were to be unlucky enough to fall off this path and splash into this volcanic lake, you would die. You would die very quickly. And you would die in excruciating pain as you were boiled to death in a great big volcanic lake of boiling hot acidic water. And actually, if they didn't fish your corpse out of this lake quickly enough, the skin and the flesh and the muscles would be dissolved off your bones. It's that hot and that acidic. This is not the kind of place you ever want to go skinny dipping on holiday. Go, go to the beach instead, swim in the seawater, which is much closer to our, um, to our physiology. But the colours of this lake, the greens and the yellows and the oranges and reds, those are the colours of life. They're the colours of acidophiles, or acid-loving organisms, and thermophiles, heat loving organisms. There, there are bugs thriving in this punishing environment, uh, calling this hellhole their home. And there's a whole range of different kinds of extremophiles, living in very hot conditions, very cold conditions, very salty conditions, very alkaline conditions, very acid conditions, very high pressures, very low pressures. And you can consider all of these extremophiles, all of these best examples of, of survivalists, of, of life that we've already discovered on our planet, and plot them up on a, a kind of graph um, to look at the different ranges of conditions that life on Earth we've already discovered can survive in. And he built up what's known as the survival envelope of all life on Earth. And the key take home message from this graph, I'm not going to linger on it, is that the survival envelope of life on Earth, stuff we've already discovered thriving in different environments and habitats on Earth, overlaps with conditions we think or we know exist in extraterrestrial places. So if we're talking about the upper cloud decks of Venus, or the dry, beneath the dry, dusty surface of Mars, or Jupiter's moon Europa, where we think there's an alien ocean, um, there's stuff on Earth we've already found that could survive on these other planets and moons. Uh, so it, it really isn't all that crazy at all to be talking about alien life, because stuff we already know about can survive in some of these other places. Um, Mars is a, is a very interesting case. It's our next door neighbor as a planet. And we know for a fact that billions of years ago, when life was first getting started here, 
when, when the genesis of life on Earth was occurring, Mars was a much, much more Earth-like place itself. It had a, a thick, insulating, protecting atmosphere. It had seas and lakes and rivers of water gushing across its surface. And it would have had organic molecules that the building blocks of all life as we know it, raining down out of the heavens and aboard meteorites and, and comets, just as they did on the surface of Earth, and maybe helped life get started here. Um, and actually, I was at the Natural History Museum um, just on down South Kensington today, picking up some samples of some of these kinds of meteorites. Meteorites that are older than the planet itself, that I was holding in my hand, that are absolutely stuffed, packed with organic molecules. The building blocks of all that stuff we saw in the video um, can be created, can be synthesized in outer space. Um, now, one of the projects I'm involved in with, with Mars is this rover called ExoMars. It's being put together by Europeans as well as NASA, specifically to look for signs of life um, on the surface of Mars. It's got lots of scientific instrumentation and, importantly, a, a drill that's going to allow us to get a good arm's length underground on Mars to grab a handful of Martian dirt, bring it back up to the surface where it's been protected from all this radiation that I've been talking about, um, and, and test it for signs of life. Um, so this is a bit of a whistle-stop talk. I'm, I'm hopefully seeding um, some ideas and, and different things we can talk about and discuss later. Um, in the outer solar system, orbiting Jupiter, we find a whole mini-solar system of moons, um, the Galilean satellites, with Io being a, a bright orange-yellowy colour. Io is a horribly, violently tortured world. It's constantly volcanically active, constantly vomiting its inside out onto its own face and um, with violent volcanism, far more volcanically active than the Earth, uh, is the innermost moon of Jupiter. The outermost Galilean satellite, Callisto, on the other hand, is very, very cold and very, very dead. It hasn't changed its face in billions of years of solar system history. It's still scarred and pockmarked from all the craters left over from the, from the rubble and the building of the planets. But in between Io, in between this very hot, violent and tortured world, and Callisto, the cold, dead world, there lies Europa. And we think that Europa is a lovely, warm, wet world, that beneath its, its surface, its face of frozen ice, of, of water ice, there is an ocean, a dark, alien ocean, with more liquid water in it than all of the seas and lakes and rivers and oceans of the whole of the Earth put together. That it is Europa that is the water world of our solar system, not the Earth. And, and, and many astrobiologists, many scientists consider Europa has probably got an even better chance of life thriving today um, than Mars. This, this might be the gem in the solar system to, to go to and explore. Um, I want to tell you about one of the moons of, of Saturn called Titan, which is a giant of a moon. It's bigger even than the planet Mercury. And it's the only moon with, with one of these, with an atmosphere. This is the blue sky of Titan, at the top of the picture here. But this thick, smoggy haze layer you can see here has prevented us from ever seeing what the face of Titan looks like, what the landscape of this hidden moon is actually like. And it's only when we went there with a, a European probe, and you can go to the Science Museum, um, also in South Kensington, and they have the engineering model of the probe that we built here in Europe to go to Titan and to parachute down through the smog layer. Um, we had to hitch a lift with the Yanks to get out there, but it was a European probe that descended through this cloud layer and sent us back the very first photographs ever of what the hidden landscape of this mysterious moon looked like. And it looks, it looks like this. This is a picture from this probe swaying beneath its parachute, looking down between its legs, if you like, at the landscape emerging from the gloom and murk of this smog layer. And we see that the landscape of Titan is uncannily like the English countryside. There are hills. The pale regions up here are the, the highlands of Titan. This dark region here we think is very, very smooth and very flat. We think it's a dried up lake. And undeniably, snaking their way down from the hills and spilling out in this dried up lake are networks of river valleys. And since this image was taken, we have seen rain clouds and drizzle and lakes full of fluid on the surface of Titan. This is the only place in the entire universe beyond the Earth that we know has got fluid sloshing around on its surface. Um, and so potentially has got an environment suitable for life. Although Titan is, is truly, truly cold. It's 
about minus 180 degrees Celsius on its surface, and it's liquid methane that falls as drizzle and flows down these rivers, not liquid water. So if there is life on Titan, it's going to be methane-based, not water-based, like, like all of us here. Um, one final thing I want to talk about was um, planets we're now discovering orbiting other stars in our galaxy, in our, in our neck of the woods. This is us right here in Clerkenwell, um, on a, a small rock orbiting a, a middle-aged, boring star just on the inside edge of one of these glorious um, spiral arms of this pinwheel of a galaxy that we live in. But we're already discovering planets that are getting increasingly, we're finding more and more Earth-like planets as the years go by and our telescopes get better, more sensitive. And this very exciting planet with a shockingly dull name, Gliese 581g, is what happens when astronomers give names to stuff, um, is about the most Earth-like place we've, we've discovered so far. It's a super-Earth, it's several times bigger than our planet, um, but it is a rocky planet, it's not a big gassy bloated giant like something like Jupiter. Um, and it orbits its sun in, in the sweet spot. It's not too hot and close, it's not too far away and cold, but it's just the right orbit to have the right kind of warmth for liquid water on its surface. But this could well be a wet world, a wet Earth. But things are going to get even better than this, because last year we launched a space telescope called Kepler, which is quite a lot like Hubble, but Kepler has one job and one job only for its entire lifetime, for the next three years, Kepler is staring at exactly the same tiny patch of sky. He's never allowed to look around and explore the heavens like Hubble is. Kepler is staring, peering, back along the spiral arm of our galaxy. This yellow triangle is where Kepler's looking. And it's monitoring 100,000 stars simultaneously, waiting for when some of those stars blink back at it. Because if a star blinks back at you, there's a good chance it's because a planet that just passed across its face and blocked out some of that starlight. So you can use this transit method, it's called, as a very, very effective way of discovering new worlds orbiting other suns, orbiting other stars in our neck of the woods, in our part of the galaxy. And Kepler's already discovered, in just the first couple of months of being switched on, over one and a half thousand new planets. Um, but there's every chance, there's every expectation that in the next couple of years, Kepler's going to discover a very, very special kind of planet indeed, a, a genuine second Earth. Earth-sized planet orbiting a sun-like star with an orbit of exactly one year. I, it orbits its sun at just the same distance that we orbit ours. It's, it's got the same temperature, oceans and seas and rivers of water, and continents perhaps flushed green with the colour of vegetation. So watch the newspaper, guys, is, is, is kind of what I'm trying to say, um, because we wholly expect this discovery, this announcement in the next couple of years, the next two or three years, as Kepler is studying all of these stars. Um, so I'm trying to keep that quite short and snappy. Um, I've, I've brushed over a, a whole field of stuff. Um, we can talk um, when we come to discussions later about any of this stuff about extreme forms of life on Earth and how life here got started, we think. Um, some of these regions, some of these places, we think, may be able to host extraterrestrial life. Some of the planets and moons in our solar system, or some of these planets and other worlds that we're discovering orbiting other suns. Um, to put a single shameless plug um, there's a, a most excellent book called Life in the Universe, A Beginner's Guide, that you can pick off Amazon for, for less than I can sell it to you from, from my own publishers, um, by a young author called, called Lewis Dartnell. Um, so if any of this has interested you, um, pick up a copy of that and you can read a bit more about this the science of astrobiology. Um, Thank you for that. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening next. Um, I was probably emailed. I don't think I read it properly. I'm going to pass back to Noom. Well, thank you, Lewis. We have a little bit of time for some questions and answers. So, who says? I just have a question about discovering the other planets. So you say it's when they see a blink from a star, but then once they've seen the blink, do they get like then zoom in on that place and actually see much more detail? Is that how it's done? Um. So this, this blink method is one of the ways we're using to detect other, other planets orbiting other stars. There are other methods, but what 
we can't do at the moment. We're really at the edge of what we are technologically able to do at the moment, is to discover those planets in the first place. Um, imagine how bright a star is and how small a planet is in comparison, and the tiny dip in starlight that, that happens. It's not like the moon passing across our sun and turning night to day. It's a tiny little dip in starlight, and it's very, very hard to measure at all. And what we can't do just yet is zoom in, like you're saying, to see just that planet. But it's something we would very much like to be able to do, and it's something we're trying to do with the next generation of telescopes, is, is to blot out the light from the sun, from the star, and look at the light from the planet itself. Because by doing that, we can start doing some, some snazzy physics on the light from the, from the planet. We can read the chemistry of its atmosphere. And if we do find a planet like this, and we can read the chemistry of its atmosphere, and we see things like oxygen in the air, there's no way we know how to explain that other than life. The only reason that we have 20% oxygen that we're breathing right now is because life has put it there. And if we see a similar atmosphere on another planet, that, that's as much as a, as a flash of red light for life as, as we know what to look for. I think there was another question around here. Yeah. Uh, as far as sort of origins of life go, about sort of asteroid stars and that, or primordial soup, or any of those kind of things, how do you think it started on Earth? So the question, if you didn't hear it, was how did life get started here on Earth? Um, the the shirk away answer is we haven't the foggiest. Um, a project I'm working on, also at UCL, with, with a guy called Nick Lane. Um, is to look into the, the idea that life got started not on the surface, not in Darwin's little pond or one of these primordial soups, but life got started very deep and very dark at the bottom of the sea, um, where we find these hydrothermal vents. And there seems to be an awful lot of very interesting chemistry going on in these hydrothermal vents, taking you from kind of basic organic compounds and possibly all the way up to, to fully fledged cells, to, to the you know, first, first life. So what I've been designing and building on the lab bench for the last couple of months is, is essentially a hydrothermal vent on our lab bench. We've got a great big glass vessel with lots of heating systems and circulation systems. and We're pumping around lots of hot fluids to see what kind of chemistry gets going on and, and, and see how far down that chain of, of the origins of life we, we can push it. Um, I suspect in three years of funding we've got, we're probably not going to find something tinking on the inside of the glass asking to be let out. Um, but, it, but it's early steps. What do you think about um, the theory that life came on board a comet, but didn't actually originate? So the, the question there is, um, do I think life originated elsewhere and was delivered to Earth on a comet? Um, I personally don't think so. Um, as, I, as I was saying, there's an awful lot of stuff we find in outer space jam-packed with the building blocks of life, with organic molecules. But I don't think on a, uh, elsewhere, I, I think on, you need to get an Earth-like planet with, with an atmosphere and with oceans and with the warmth of a sun to get those chemicals to build up to something as mind-bogglingly complex as a single cell, like we saw in that video. I don't think that can happen in what's essentially a big snowball um, on, the, on the outer edge of the solar system. Um, so I'm all up for the idea that the building blocks of life could have been delivered from elsewhere, but I don't think that life itself can be delivered from elsewhere. I think we're native in that sense, that we got started here. Um, although there, there do seem to be ways of spreading life between planets but it has to get started on a planet before it can get spread, spread to another, another world and yeah. inside a meteorite or something. Um, one more question? How, how are we doing for time? I have a question. Oh, you have one. Yeah. Um, and then, then I'll come to, to you, sir. In, in this uh, SETI uh, conversation uh, last year, I mean, they, they were asking something very interesting, and that is if, if there's already life in the Earth, how would we know it? If there's alien life? Is it, that's the question, how would we know if... So is, is that the question, if, if we were aliens looking back at Earth, how could we detect no, ourselves? If, 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 or if there's alien life already here already, on Earth? Uh, exactly, like in terms of, like, in form of bacteria or whatever, is there, is there a way to know it? it? It's a very, very good question. It's a very interesting area of research. And there's the idea that, um, of a shadow biosphere, perhaps we aren't the only life forms on Earth, and there actually is... Either life got started more than once on Earth, and we just assume we're the only things kicking around here. Maybe, the, maybe life got started more than once on Earth, maybe in different hydrothermal vents, and we just haven't spotted our cousins yet because we're looking in the, in the wrong way. Or perhaps alien life has been delivered to Earth. Perhaps it did arrive aboard a meteorite, maybe from Mars. Um, and it makes sense that the reason we haven't spotted alien life is because we know how to look for stuff like us. We look for DNA, we look for proteins. 
But if life is built in a fundamentally different way, none of our tests would find it. So there is a chance, there's a good chance, that maybe there is either a shadow biosphere here on Earth or, or alien life that we've just been overlooking because we're, we're looking for it the wrong way. Because we're, we're looking for alien life in the way we'd look for ourselves when we're, when we're looking for life in these kind of, you know, volcanic ponds and things that are showing earlier in the talk. Um, so pe people are trying to think out of the box and thinking about how we might look for alien life here on Earth and not save ourselves the effort of going all the way over to Mars. Mm -hmm. um, what, sorry, what might that life look like? So, life in our solar system on, on Mars or Europa or Titan will be primitive, single cellular life. It will be like bacteria on Earth. So if you look down a microscope with um, Earth bacteria, or Mars bacteria, or Europa bacteria, you probably won't be able to tell the difference. Under a normal light microscope, you'd see little blobs swimming around. And it's only when you kind of start taking apart those cells to see if they use DNA to store their information, to see if they use proteins, like we saw in that video, to see if they've got the same oily, fatty molecules making up the kind of envelopes around them. Because if you find cells here on Earth that don't use DNA, that's, that's going to be a very big deal because it's different from us. It's, it's either alien life that's here or life on Earth that got started at a different time or a different place um, because it's built in a, in a fundamentally different way to all life that we know about so far. Um, so there's one guy at the back here, yeah? Yep. yep. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, people tend to they, they work out how likely it is that a life exists somewhere else in the universe. Like, you know, there are all these number of planets you said just now that you expect to see a second Earth at some time. Um, do you know where the consensus is in terms of whether it's absolutely certain that there is definite life somewhere else in the think, universe? John, were you going to... I can't see where John's gone. Um, are you going to cover a, a bit of that? I don't want to steal your thunder on this one. I'll have a go. Yeah, um, wait. <laughs> John, so there's, there's the idea of the Drake equation and trying to mathematically calculate how many other intelligent civilizations might be out there. And I, and I think this is something that John's going to talk about, so I'll, I'll let him have that money shot. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. Cheers.